people don't necessarily know that the large majority of people who lose weight on diets regain it plus even extra weight. So if you look at sort of all the studies of diets, all the long-term randomized controlled trials of diets, so the gold standard studies of diets, and if you look at the ones that follow dieters for at least two years, what you find is that the average amount of weight regain is all but two pounds. Hi guys, welcome back. Today we're going to visit with a YouTuber named Carrie Corbett Owen. And we're gonna listen in as she interviews Tracy Mann. And Tracy Mann is of the belief that maybe all this diet and exercising isn't worth it because 95 plus percent of people end up gaining all the weight back within five years of a diet or weight loss routine. So let's hear what she has to say. This ought to be interesting. This is Carrie Corbett Owen from BodyWise Perfect Size, talking to Dr. Tracy Mann from the Eating Lab. Tracy, tell me about your own personal story and how you got interested in weight. I did one diet once, second year of high school, lasted about three weeks. It was not fun. I hated it. It was shocking to me why anyone would do it. My parents were constant dieters, on again, off again, losing, regaining. It all looked just nuts to me. So it never fully got into my head that it was a good thing to do. I feel like I got a, a slightly weird view of dieting from, from that experience. But the thing that started me doing research on it was the first time I read an article about obesity in grad school. And it just floored me because everything that scientific paper showed to be true was the opposite of everything I'd always heard. You know, so uh, what was that paper? I believe that paper was the one that said, that looked at sort of food diaries, how much people ate over the course of two weeks, and they compared how much fat people ate versus thin people. Are we allowed to use the word fat? Uh, I never know. I'm, it's just a word, not a judgment. Nice description. Um, what their study showed is that there wasn't a difference in the amount of calories over two weeks eaten by thinner fat people. And, you know, I just, that just floored me. It's like, what? But all I ever hear is that fat people are overeating, you know, extraordinarily and thin people are resisting everything. Not true. Not true. That's not how it is. Um, and then I started learning about the genetics of weight. You know, weight is 70% genetically determined. There's only a little wiggle room in there. Um, that fascinated me. All those things made me quite interested in it. Tracy, you've written a fantastic book, Secrets from the Eating Lab. Why did you think it was necessary to write this book? I needed to write this book because I got so sick of people blaming dieters when they lose weight and regain it. Uh, people constantly say they have no self-control they're weak, they just didn't want it enough, all kinds of things like that. And I just couldn't take it anymore. So I wanted to write this book so that I could clarify why people regain weight after dieting and then what they can do instead to be healthy. I'm so glad I found this video. I think this is extremely interesting. If you agree, please let us know what your thoughts are right now in the comments. You're going to start looking a lot like your parents and grandparents, whether you like it or not. And it also sounds like she believes that we eat the same regardless of our weight. I don't know if I agree with that one. But tell me if you agree with me or if you disagree down below. What is it that you think is wrong? People don't necessarily know that the large majority of people who lose weight on diets regain it, plus even extra weight. So if you look at sort of all the studies of diets, all the long-term randomized controlled trials of diets, so the gold standard studies of diets, and if you look at the ones that follow dieters for at least two years, what you find is that the average amount of weight regain is all but two pounds. I've also heard, and this number isn't my own, but it seems fairly convincing. I've heard that about only 5% of dieters keep off the weight that they took off in the long run. The majority of people gain it back. Are we really to believe that all those people are weak? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. I'm a social psychologist and in social psychology, 
when we see a large majority of people behaving all the same way, we know it's not about the person. We know it's about something bigger than the person, something about the environment, something physical, whatever. It's not the person's uh, own will. And that's definitely the case with dieting. So when it comes to dieting, and I think this is the biggest misconception, willpower is not your friend and willpower is not what separates the thin from the fat. Um, willpower, it, it's just basically, if willpower is going to work for you, it has to be 100% perfect. And nobody's 100% perfect. Here's why I say that. It just kind of picture this situation. We've all been in some version of the situation. You are in a meeting and somebody comes in, some lovely colleague comes in with a box of donuts. And that's great. And that's awesome to them. But suppose you're trying to resist that donut. Okay, to resist it, you have to resist it repeatedly. Okay, this is not just one act of self-control, right? You resist it when they come in, great. But that box is still sitting there and you're in that meeting for an hour. Every time you kind of glance over to wherever that box is, you have to resist it again, another act of self-control. So if you resist it 19 times, but then on the 20th time, you have a moment of weakness and you eat it, you don't get credit for those 19 impressive acts of self-control, right? You're just the same as someone who only resisted it twice. So let's say that situation is daily, okay? If you look over at those donuts 19 times in one day, but on the 20th time you look over, you you give in to temptation and you eat it, then yeah, I suppose that's the same as somebody that just gave in the first time they looked at the donut, right? But if you have those donuts in the office 20 consecutive days and you decide to have a donut one of those 20 days while your coworkers decide to have it each and every day, that is a win. Okay, so... With eating, willpower does not really work because prior successes at willpower get sort of wiped away, get kind of erased by a failure at willpower. Does that make sense? So like, okay, so with eating, little tiny failures of, of self-control erase previous successes. And because of that, and this is maybe the technical part, but because of that, it basically erases the differences between people. Um, and the only distinctions in terms of how good they are at self-control, it just doesn't matter. Um, and the only thing that matters are the total extremes of the scale, which, you know, most people aren't. So other people... By the way, in all fairness to Tracy Mann, she's not really doom and gloom. What she's really doing is regurgitating what the science says. The science does definitively say that 95 to 98% of people that lose a pretty decent chunk of weight now will gain it back within five years and in many cases then some so what we have to do is we have to get you addicted to something that totally kills the calories like a daily walk we'll talk about that more in a second here people with great control whenever i tell people that i study self-control of eating or willpower they always tell me that they have terrible willpower they always say oh my gosh you know tell me your secrets what are your secrets I need help with that. And they all say it as if it's their own sort of unique situation when really it's everybody. You know, I mean, I've never encountered in all these years, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never had anybody say to me, you know, my willpower is great. You should study me. You know, nobody's ever done that. Um, so everybody thinks their willpower is bad because nobody's is perfect. And unless it's perfect, it is going to feel like it's bad. And negative looms larger than positive. You see that all through psychology. I see that. Uh, you see that in all kinds of things that have nothing to do with weight. So back to willpower. So the other reason I think that people think they have bad willpower is because they go on diets and regain the weight. So I've already mentioned that most people regain the weight. Now, the reason people regain the weight is not because of their bad willpower. Okay, we all have bad willpower. We're even. There's nothing, no differences there. The reason people regain weight after dieting is because when, when you diet, when you restrict the amount of food you're eating, you put your body into a state of deprivation. And our body has evolved to respond a certain way to that state of deprivation. And all of those things it does makes it way too easy to regain weight and way too hard to keep it off. 
So three kinds of things your body does in response to deprivation. One of them, uh, one kind of change that happens is hormone changes. So the levels of different hormones change as they're flowing through your body. So hormones that help you feel full, they, those, the levels of those go down. But hormones that keep you feeling hungry, the level of those go up. So after dieting, you're more likely to feel hungry, even if you eat the same stuff that didn't leave you feeling hungry before. Okay, that is harsh. That is not fair. Um, so that's hormone type changes. Um, metabolic changes, I think people sort of have a sense of this already, but after dieting, your metabolism changes. Your body gets really good at running itself on fewer calories than normal. That leaves more left over to store as fat. And what that means is you can eat the same number of calories, but instead of losing weight, now you're staying same. Um, you can be eating the same amount of calories that you were eating while losing weight, but now you don't lose weight anymore. You stay the same or you regain. And yet people blame this all the time on their own willpower. Hey, if a cigarette smoker smokes eight cigarettes a day during work and then another eight during his time at home, so 16 to 20 cigarettes a day, and he does that for 20 years, does he have amazing willpower or does he have a really bad habit that's become a, an addictive routine, right? One of the things that we can do is instead of getting into a cigarette smoking habit, right, we can get into a walking routine, a walking habit. I've been walking for the last 100 days and many of our fellow viewers here on YouTube have been walking with me. We would love for you to walk with us. And she also said that 70% of us are victims to our parents' DNA, which I suppose is true. But I want to show you something. What do you think of this? Guys, this is from a, a YouTuber called The History Lounge. And this is a picture of New York City in stunning color. And I do agree, this is stunning. And this is from the 1900s. So these are all the parents of the parents that were DNA victims of, right? Can you tell me and point real quick to one of these thousand of people on the street? Can you show me the one that's overweight and fat? And can you show me how they are all walking and they are all in amazing shape? You know, the other day when I started this challenge, I was 185 pounds and five foot nine and a half, right? So I was about the average size of somebody here in America now. That's five foot nine and a half, right? But now I'm 165 pounds, which is the average size of a five foot nine American in 1960. The only thing different is I'm walking every day, I'm drinking water every day, and I'm avoiding sugar every day. And if I mess up on any one of those three rules, so to speak, I just obey the other two. So if you really want to lose weight and you want it to be somewhat quickly, go get your shoes on. Let's go for a walk. How are you? I hope you guys are having a wonderful day out there. It is Wednesday, which means it is Friday Eve for you guys. I always think uh, Wednesday and Thursday are interesting because that's when you start to uh, email your coworkers and you start to message your coworkers if you're working from home and you start to say things like happy hump day, happy Thursday, happy Friday Eve. And then, of course, on Friday, we get the old TGIF, and thank goodness it finally came. The weekend is here. 
It's amazing how uh, Monday through Friday can make you so excited for Saturday and Sunday, isn't it? So we, we, we naturally yearn for that time away from responsibility. Because if you think about it, if you really enjoy your job, it's not that big of a deal to work, right? But at the same time, sometimes it's nice just to be able to say, I don't have to work today, no responsibilities. That's always nice, actually. Guys, I got a story today that's a little disconcerting, but before we get to that story, let's talk Elaine Bellew. Elaine, congratulations. You're our number one ranked venter, I believe. I say I believe because there might be somebody in silence that's lost 40 or 50 pounds, right? But more than likely, you're in first place, Elaine. We want to congratulate you. So check this out, guys. Elaine just recently hit her 100th day, which basically means Elaine's been walking basically since day one with us, right? And Elaine has lost a whopping 35 pounds. Wow, that's amazing. Elaine, you took the same idea that I did that ultimately you and I had a very nice, successful fail. Okay, now I know that most people would think, well, Jesse, if you lost 18 pounds and Elaine, if you lost 35 pounds, there's absolutely no way in the world we can consider that a fail. But Elaine, you want to know something? If you and I look at it like a fail, then what we're going to have is a situation where we keep moving in the right direction. So I recommend for all of you, try to move in the right direction. Try to keep going. All right, we had a walker there that saw me coming and went across the street. So you remember the other day when I was telling you guys, you know, you see a weird, suspicious character walk across the street. So apparently he looked at me and thought, weird, suspicious character, I'm going to walk across the street. <laughs> all right, mister, all right. But now that you're ditching me when I have a camera, mister, now I have to wonder if you just don't want to be on camera because maybe you're wanted. You remember when we used to watch uh, Unsolved Mysteries and they would show these mug shots of people and the mug shots would be like artist renditions. Oh my God, did those mug shots scare the heck out of you? I think this guy has an Unsolved Mysteries mug shot out there somewhere and he just doesn't want to be on camera. No, but seriously, I was walking towards this guy and he kind of walked around a car to get like away from me. I thought that was kind of interesting. So Elaine, back to what I was saying about you, let's keep it going. I know you want to lose ultimately, I believe you said 50 pounds. That means you got another 15 to go. Heck, let's do this. Now, what was interesting about Elaine's comment is she said 35 pounds, 100 days. For all I know, that might have been her saying, I'm done with my 100 day challenge. But Elaine, hopefully you stay with us. Let's use that extra 15 or lose that extra 15 pounds. Excuse me. Guys, uh, besides the Elaine story, which is 100% positive, I heard another story that really got my brain thinking about a lot of things, and let's talk about that now. So, Amanda Lee says that for six years, starting at the age of 15, former U.S. swim coach Joseph Bernal, or Bernal, actually took advantage of her sexually. Apparently it started at age 15 where it started with a kiss that he gave her after a college swim meet. And I just thought, my God, that is crazy. How the heck is she swimming for a college team at the age of 15? Uh, but apparently she was, or it was a college meet. I don't know if, I don't know exactly what she's doing there at age 15, unless she's one of these brainiac kids where they're already uh, able to go and enter college at such a young age. But check this out. He actually got her pregnant during college and um, her assistant coaches all knew about this. That's what kind of makes it horrible. Coach Bernal actually paid for Amanda Lee to get an abortion. And I just thought that was awful. She started keeping a diary of what was happening 
because she described the relationship as part coach, part parental, part boyfriend, girlfriend. And she said it really put a lot of mental weirdness into her life. And I couldn't help but think, yeah, that, that, that describes mental weirdness pretty well. The one thing that I noticed is that this kind of reminds me uh, of the UCLA men's track team where a couple years back I heard that one of the coaches was going to the male athletes and, and molesting them and doing weird things and telling them that, hey, you know, this will help you with your athletic career and stuff. And it's just, it weirded me out because apparently this UCLA track coach did this to quite a few men that would consider themselves heterosexual. And it just really kind of blows me away that at age 18, 19, 20, you're this really big, buff, huge college athlete, right? Which a lot of these athletes are. I just can't believe like nothing in your brain tells you, don't let people in authority do this to you. But unfortunately, we have a situation where people in authority feel like they have a green light to do this to people. So I almost feel like we need to put out public commercials to young people that basically says, don't let coaches do this to you. And we need to start letting assistant coaches that know this stuff is happening, we need to start letting people know that if you don't come forward and it's found out that you knew in advance, you're going to prison and you're going to prison for a long time. We need to stop this. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but this happens especially for women's gymnastics. Good morning. This happens especially for women's gymnastics, where after a girl will do a good routine or even a poor routine, is it just me or does it always seem like the coaches are there to give a big hug? And I don't know if you'd agree. Hey, let's go through the park. I don't know if you'd agree, but a lot of times, these hugs look really weird, full embracing hugs, kisses on the cheek, things that just have always seemed extremely iffy to me. I think those things need to be quashed. I think we need to get it where there's no more hugging of coaches. If you wanna do a team hug at the end of a gold medal victory or a silver medal victory, right? That's understandable. But we need to get men, especially, away from these women, right? We need to get to a point where adults know these kids are off limits. All kids are off limits. And if you keep doing this stuff, you're going to jail and so are your accomplices. It needs to be iron-fisted. And uh, we need an iron-fisted, God, that, that probably sounds, <laughs> sounds about right. We need to make sure that these people know you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, we should let people know now, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble unless you come forward and start giving up the information before we have to go yank it out of you. Jesse, that doesn't sound like dealing with the Constitution and everybody giving everybody their rights. Yeah, I know, that's how upsetting this stuff is. It makes you wanna throw the books out and just get those coaches. They need to go take every coach and put them through a lie detector test right now and find out if they're doing these horrible things to kids. This also reminds me of our problem here in this country with uh, the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts is one of those things where you come to find out that they've had thousands of boys through the years that have been molested by these scout leaders. I've always, even since I was little, I've always wondered why the hell are these men out there with all these boys, you know? And you're, and you're always led to believe that, oh, there's really good men out there that want to teach these young men how to grow up and, you know, a, be a great part of their community. Yeah, I'm sure they do exist. But out of all those thousands of men, you know as well as I do, there's probably a decent chunk of them that are perverts. I think that if you're a parent, you should never drop your kid off at practice. I think if you're a parent, you should never leave your kid alone at church with church elders. I believe that if you're a parent, it is your responsibility to make sure that your kids make it from age zero to age 18 with all 10 fingers and all 10 toes, two eyeballs, 
if people are getting access to your kids, you have to look at yourself and say, you know what? I'm out of the picture too damn much. This needs to stop. And I'm sure you guys have heard about the Nickelodeon scandals too, right? Nickelodeon was a channel of really good cartoons and really fun little sitcoms that a lot of us grew up on. But to find out that a good majority of those kid actors were basically molested and uh, you know taken advantage of in a horrible way by their coaches and people, my God, that is just unacceptable. So again, if you're a Hollywood parent, if your kids are actors or athletes, you need to make a commitment to your children that no, you're not gonna let them go on a, a vacation out of town with their coaches. You're not gonna let them drive on a bus with their coaches unless there's gonna be incredible amounts of adult supervision with them. And I mean, other, I mean other athletes' parents. If these coaches can't be trusted, then they can't be trusted. And it seems to me that like, no matter how loving a coach is, those are the ones to be trusted the least. We've been, we've been in a bad way in this country and the world where we trust these people because they have a nice smile and because they seem like the kids love them. Well, no wonder the kids love them. The kids are being abused and there's no one there for them to turn to. And for a kid to get to a point where they have to pay for an abortion, and then guess what? Coach Bernal died a couple years ago. So is anybody gonna get in trouble uh, with regards to Coach Bernal? Who knows, but I hope, I hope they go after all these coaches. And I'm telling you, these coaches need to be punished to the nth degree. I'm hoping this is one of those things that we all agree on, but if you do disagree with me or agree with me, please let me know in the comments. I just think it's a crying shame that we send our kids off to Boy Scouts and these bad things happen, that we send our kids off to Sunday school or off to church or off to mass and these bad things happen. We send kids to gymnastics, Olympics, ice skating coaches and these things happen. I think we need to start looking at the psychological makeup of both men and women that want to work with kids and teenagers and we need to start asking ourselves are these people sexual deviants if they're sexual deviants they need to be punished okay they need to be eliminated they need to have their jobs eliminated and those type of people in my opinion should be forced to wear an ankle bracelet for the rest of their lives if you're going to do these things to people's kids God, you're so lucky that I'm not in charge. I would get real biblical and medieval at these people. And it's just really, really frustrating because, again, we live in a world where nobody seems to care until it's their kid. And then when it's their kid, they want to make this big hubbub and get all these monies and all these lawsuits going, which, which is good. But you know what it ends up dealing with? it ends up dealing with a situation where change doesn't occur. Case in point, that guy that did it on the US Olympic team, remember, uh, Coach Nasser or whatever his name was? That happened. Shouldn't that have made it where from that point on, this thing with the uh, swimmer here on the US swim team, shouldn't that uh, situation with Coach Nasser and the gymnastics, shouldn't that have put a spotlight on people like Coach Bernal and the US swim team? Shouldn't this be the worst time and the least expected time to hear any more of these troubles or issues? There's a lot of turmoil, in my opinion, with these coaches. And I think maybe we need to get a situation where instead of us talking about policemen wearing body cams, which I think we all can agree all policemen should wear body cams, but I think we need to start taking it a step further. If you're gonna be a coach dealing with kids, if you're gonna be a scout leader dealing with kids or anything, maybe we need to create body cams, you know, for these people. And if you turn it off, it's gonna look very suspect. So no turning it off. That's what we ought to do. Instead of using this uh, technology to film criminals and then letting them out off, right? Because that's what our court systems are famous for nowadays. We don't prosecute criminals. We don't make them pay for their crimes. So if we're not gonna use those cameras for good, 
let's put those cameras on, on coaches and on scout leaders. And I'm sure with brownies and Girl Scouts, I'm sure, that, sure this weird stuff happens too. We always find out about it 10 or 15 years after the fact. And the reason we do is because not only does it take time for the kids to tell their parents and to get the word out, right? And to come, to get the bravery to come forward. But apparently we have a lot of accomplices, right? That are fellow coaches, fellow scout leaders that a lot of times know about this junk, but are too wimpy to come forward and say and do the right thing. So my thinking is, since you're too wimpy to do the right thing, get out of coaching or go to jail. I feel like a lot of these problems could be solved if we started throwing people in jail and then tossing the key in the trash, you know? That's what we need to do. And for our real heinous criminals, guys, we really need to just, is this a vent? Yeah, I guess so. I'm tired of hearing these stories. This happens with teachers too. Have you guys noticed that when we were young, I mean young as in the 80s, 90s, and the 70s, you never ever heard stories of teachers doing things with kids. And if you did, it was extremely rare. God, I feel like nowadays it's not even rare. I'd be willing to bet somewhere out there in this country of 50 states right now as we speak, I'd be willing to bet that there's not dozens but hundreds of teachers that are having these inappropriate relationships with students. I'd be willing to bet that it's not dozens but hundreds of soccer and football coaches and Boy Scout troop leaders that are still to this day doing this weird goofy stuff. And I think a lot of times parents, especially ones that make money, they love taking their daughters and their sons and dropping them off at these three hour practice sessions. I remember my daughter when she was younger, she was in competitive dance and she would literally be dropped off four or five times a week so that she could do a three or four hour dance practice with her, with her competitive dance team. And thankfully my daughter was never bothered or anything, but it's just like, my God, that's putting children at risk. And I just don't think parents should do that. And I think a lot of times affluent parents, that's part of the advantage of having a lot of money when you're, when you're successful, is you can pay for things like competitive dance and these things where other men and women are there with your kids and you're not because you don't wanna sit there for a three or four hour practice, you wanna go do your thing. And I think that that's really putting our kids at risk. Now, a lot of us are parents, a lot of us had our kids in t-ball and softball and baseball and soccer and all these sports and stuff. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. Because when I was dropped off for soccer and football practice, it seemed like there was always a good half dozen to a dozen parents that were there watching every moment. But at the same time, I had teammates and stuff that would be dropped off and their parents were never there. And if you're one of these parents that looks at, uh, that looks at sports and looks at these different situations that you, in, that you put your kids in, if you look at those situations as babysitters, you're really doing your kid a disservice. Because that was one of the things that I never liked. Because keep in mind, I was in my daughter's life every Wednesday and every other weekend, okay? So what happened on my non-days where I didn't have uh, the ability to be in my daughter's life, that was none of my business. And if you went to the courts back in the day and you said, hey, on Tuesday and Wednesday, I really don't like that my daughter is dropped off at dance for five hours, the judge would tell you flat out that's none of your business, okay? And to a great extent, I agree with him. If I have my child for the weekend, the mom should be out of the picture. If the mom has the child for the week, you know, the dad or the non-custodial parent should be out of the picture, I guess, right? But, in, but the reality of things are, it used to be very unfair for a lot of men, and there's a lot of men to this day that'll still tell you the court system is very unfair to us. I think 85% of court custody cases get won by the female still. And I think that's down from like 98% a couple of decades ago. So we're, st we're, st we're talking, it's a situation 
where a lot of times through divorce and separation, men are out of their kids' lives, and then it leaves room for a lot of bad things to happen to kids. Now, does that mean that we should all be forced to stay with our partners and never break up with them? No, sometimes people legitimately shouldn't be together, right? And people should have the right to divorce or should have the right to separate, although I think we should try not to separate and not to divorce. But at the same time, gosh, if you're a parent, decide if you wanna be in your kids' lives, and if you don't, have the other parent get custody of your child. Because that's the one thing that to this day still kind of bothers me about my, about my daughter's mom. She really did see the child support that I gave her and the money that she earned. She really did see our daughter as a situation where, hey, if I have her in competitive dance, I don't need to be a mom all the time. And that's something that I felt for years when it comes to my ex. The mother of my son is different from the mother of my daughter. The mother of my daughter was always interested in competing with the Joneses, right? So if her friends were successful and stuff, she wanted to come across as successful and stuff. And one of the things that her and the other moms of these competitive dance uh, kids would do is they love just dropping their kids off and then doing their own thing for three or four hours every day. And that's really disappointing. I think over the last 20 years, we've seen a real evolution. The parenting has gone down, and I feel like the kids that are out of control have gone up, right? And I think it's because when you really boil it down, I think kids nowadays are smart enough to realize that some of their parents are invested in their lives, and some of their parents don't really give a crap. And when you know that your parent doesn't really give a crap while your friend's parents are invested in them, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to see that. You know, um, I think it was the New York girl, Jamie B. It was somebody who was telling me a couple months ago that uh, in their house, they would have a lot of expired food and that they had to start taking over the cooking because it, it just wasn't in their mom to stay on top of things. And when you're cooking expired food, right, there's always a chance that you could cook something that could literally make you sick. And so they actually experienced food poisoning a couple times. And so she said in her comment that she basically started taking over the food prep for her and her siblings. That's a perfect example of parents that are kind of lackadaisical and not really invested in their kids. If you can't even keep track of the food in your house and if it's expired or not, my God, that's like the minimal requirements of being a human being, you don't want to drink expired milk. You don't want to eat expired foods. And if you're getting to the point where your kids have to go to the hospital for food poisoning, God, what is wrong with you? And I'm sorry if hopefully your mom's, you know, evolved out of that. But again, some people never evolve from their weird ways. So I think we, we, I think we need to all agree that moving forward, we need to start looking at these coaches with a skeptical eye. You know, hey, John, Bob, and, and Dale are managers at their job, they're electricians, and they're plumbers. Joe, why are you a coach? And why are you coaching teenage girls, right? And why are you allowed to be in rooms with them alone? There needs to be a known rule. No more being alone in a room with kids. From the preacher, uh, from the preacher the pastor and the, uh, you know, the church elders, nobody's in lo- alone in a room with a kid. And if you do come out of a, a room, you're gonna be scrutinized to the point where you're gonna hate your job. So stop doing this. And I'm telling you, we need to start throwing these people in jail and then throwing away the key. And I'm hoping this is one of those things that we can all agree on. I am tired of hearing these stories. And I think what we need to do is we need to all of a sudden stop everything and we need to do a giant investigative report on every single past and present coach that's dealing with USA Olympics or any type of sporting situation where it's adult coaches and kids. Jesse, that's millions of situations. Yeah, we need to investigate and we need to let people know 
that if we end up finding out some negative stuff and you're an assistant coach and you didn't come forward, guess who's going to jail? You. I'm always ready to throw people in jail, have you realized? But you wanna know something? If we start getting these scumbags off the street and in jail, the streets become a better place. We need to start doing the right thing. We need to start rising up and taking back our country or our world. But the first thing we need to do is we need to take care of our health. So if you're at the end of your walk, keep going. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.